So, as you know, this uh, second week of our workshop is supposed to be probabilistic, and which is why we have brought in a fantastic probabilist, Renko van der Hofstadt, to teach a mini course on complex networks. Well, he's done a lot of uh, amazing work on, on such on random graph models and processes on them over the na last maybe 10 years or so, yeah, something like 15. that. And uh, he's mm -hmm. also literally written the book on the subject. The book is sitting at the table over there. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he's going to be telling us about perhaps the, the basics of the subject. I've, I assume that it, probably everybody can ask questions at any given time, and that yes. be, he'd be happy with that. Preferably. Preferably. And uh, well, without further ado, rank over the Hofstein. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and the opportunity to give a course here. Um, of course, it's always wonderful being in Rio. Uh, it's minus 10 in the Netherlands during the nights. Here it isn't quite. And I've been enjoying the sun, as you can see from uh, the, the little tan I have, which is a little more than I had hoped for. Uh, walking along Copacabana and Ipanema on Saturday, everything cloudy, yet I got a, a serious burn. Never mind. Uh, was a good reason to do math uh, on the Sunday. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, uh, random graphs and complex networks. And uh, what I'll be talking about is the, 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 the insight that we've developed in the past 20 years or so in uh, real world networks. So I will be doing some data of networks and showing them to you because they've been uh, inspirational for uh, the kind of models that we've been uh, investigating. So just for myself, to have a bit of a background guess. Who knows what the erdos renyi random graph is? Very good, I was assuming that. Who knows what the configuration model is? Okay, that's already a bit less. Who knows what the preferential attachment model is? Okay, very good. So I will introduce these models and I will describe some of their properties. So, of course, when you give a mini course, you should think about what you want to achieve. So what is the aim in these lectures? Well, of course I cannot describe the whole of the theory of random graphs for complex networks. That's way too much. But what I would like is that you go home after this course being able to read some of the crucial papers uh, that have been written in, in random graph theory so that you have some idea as to uh, what are the ideas behind the models, what are the properties of some of these models. And you know, if research papers tend to go relatively quickly, you know, I hope to be able to give you some uh, a background on those that you'll be able to place uh, the theory a little bit. So that's my aim. Now, a course is not for me. I'm supposed to know what I'm teaching about, even though, you know, sometimes that's hard. Um, the course is for you. So if you have any questions along the way or special requests, you know, could you explain this or that? I mean, I've run across this and never quite understood it. Drop a line. I think I have some freedom to do what is best for the audience. Okay, so what is my plan of lectures? I have three lectures, and here are three items. Now, these items are not going to be equally distributed, so it's not true that I'm going to be done with the real world networks and random graph models for them today. That will probably stretch over a little bit into Wednesday. And then I will be talking about some small world phenomena in random graphs as a way to understanding um, small world phenomena in real world networks because that's what it's all about. And then I will say something about information diffusion in, in random graphs that will be on Friday, but it's a, a slightly smaller part. Think about one hour. So that's the plan. And indeed, part of the material is from this book. Um, this book you can, of course, buy, but you don't have to because the PDF is on my webpage. That's one of the things I negotiated with the publisher. You can just download it for free. There are slight differences between the PDF version, which is on my webpage, which is the last version that I produced, and the book. And actually, I will have a student who is going to fix that and make the small changes that uh, make the difference between the book and the PDF. So the PDF will really be the same. Okay. Now, that's not the only thing that I've been doing. I started writing a big book, and it's expanded and expanded and expanded. Then I decided to cut it in two. So this is volume one. There is also a volume two that I'm currently uh, working hard on. It's already on the site. It's very preliminary. There are all sorts of to-dos in there, but there are large parts that are already pretty, uh, pretty good, and I will treat some parts of those. My slides, 
the ones that you're seeing are currently available on my website, so you can just download them. You don't have to write along the whole time. Um, I will probably update the slides, and then I will also update them on my website. Now, in this field of random graph theory, probability plays in a very important role. I mean, random graphs are uh, random variables in the space of graphs. And we'll be using lots of probabilistic tools. Uh, think about first and second moment methods and branching process approximations. Um, just as a final question, who knows about branching processes? Maybe a better question, who does not know about branching processes? Okay, so there are some people who do. Okay, very good. Right, so real world networks and random graphs. So the whole burst in activity came around 1999 uh, when there were a few very influential papers published about uh, data of real world networks and some particular models for them. And uh, um, one of the things that, that happened in these days was that more and more data of real world networks became available. And then of course you can start looking at it. And this actually progressed later on. And even now people are still looking at all sorts of examples of real world networks and trying to decide what the structure of those is, whatever that means. So this is just pure empirics, looking at numbers and trying to somehow digest from them what the shape of the, the underlying uh, uh, graphs are. And here you can think about sort of what are typical distances like, um, how many neighbors do individuals in your network have, how many triangles do you have, which is a measure of clustering, um, are vertices, are edges typically connecting vertices of similar kind of degrees or completely different degrees, this is called assortativity, etc. So there are lots of questions that are being posed in the real world and uh, conclusions are being drawn because of that. So you could say that network theory, network science it's now sometimes called, is one of these multi or cross-disciplinary efforts where you have lots of different communities thinking about very similar uh, problems, each with their own history. That's quite interesting because you'll see that some of the random graph models, for no obvious reasons, are used in particular application areas. Whereas others are used in other application areas, which is quite interesting in its own. All right. So when I talk about complex networks, what are they? Well, there's not a proper definition, I would say. But in general, I think about networks that are large, let's say several 10,000, 100,000, millions, or hundreds of millions of nodes, depending on uh, the precise application. And they're complex in the sense that they're uh, quite irregular. So what you see in these pictures, so this is a picture of the yeast protein interaction network, which is from a paper of Barabasi and Oldfai. Um, what you see is that there is a high amount of, of difference in the amount of neighbors that individuals here, proteins, have. And here you draw an edge between two proteins when the proteins are interacting inside the cell. So you should really think of chemical reactions happening in the cell and somehow these proteins interacting. So it could be that one protein is, by a chemical reaction, turned into another, but it could also be that a protein acts as an, as an enzyme for, uh, uh, or a catalyst for another reaction. So the, the edges can have different meaning. Of course, you can, if you think about it, this is a representation for probably hundreds, maybe thousands of articles that have been written in biology. Somehow trying to, to decide what proteins play a role inside a yeast cell and how they're connected one way or another. Now on the right hand side you see a picture from the Opti project uh, of the internet. It's just a, an artistic visualization and you basically see something very similar. You have these sort of the, the, the vertices which uh, uh, form little stars so that means that they have many connections whereas other vertices have very few connections. So there's a high amount of uh, inhomogeneity in these networks. And this is best seen um, by visualizing what is called the degree sequence. So what you do here is, on this axis, you plot the value of the degree. In this case, it's a directed graph, so you have in degrees and out degrees, and here, you, here the in degrees are being plotted. And what you do is, for every of these values, you indicate the log of the number of um, vertices inside your network that have precisely that degree. So that explains these little lines these are all degrees that occur only once inside your network. These are degrees that occur precisely twice. And so you go up. 
And here, and we're dealing with proportions here, here you have the majority of the vertices because we're plotting this in a log-log scale. Right? So if you go down by one, actually the proportion goes down by a factor 10. So the majority of vertices is here, but what you see is that you have this whole bunch of vertices here that actually have rather large indices in this case. This is a sample of a web crawl, um, and this refers to web pages and the number of pages that link to them. That's what it means. So if you're uh, a very popular page, web page, then you actually have lots of other web pages pointing towards you, so you're probably somewhere here. So my uh, personal web page is probably somewhere here. Right? So this is a whole matter of popularity. Um, these are the very popular web pages. These are the less popular web pages. And you can imagine that in many of the real world applications, even though you have very few of these vertices, they may play a very important role. As an example, if you draw a similar picture for the degree distribution of mathematicians in the collaboration network, so you connect every mathematician to every other mathematician that he or she has ever written a paper with, then you see a very similar picture, and you have this one dot which is very far on the right. That's Paul Erdős. He has 502 or 510 collaborators, which is humongous. And we all know that Erdős played a very important role inside mathematics. So the, the, the individuals or the, the web pages or whatever you're plotting here, here on the complete right, they probably play a more important role in the functioning of the network. That's why we're interested in them. Okay? Now we're plotting them in this way, and that's because you know, physicists have told us to do so, and this is related to what are called power laws. And this is also the reason behind this scale-free phenomenon. Um, so what you see here is something like, well, that resembles a bit the straight line, now, if it would be a perfect straight line, then it would mean that this proportion here, that it denoted by P of K, of vertices of degree K, would satisfy PK being a constant times an inverse power of K. So in particular, what this means is that this decays very slowly as K becomes large. So that means also that you're bound to see vertices that have extremely high degree. You should think of positive powers of N. Even though the network is sparse, because typically these networks are sparse, the average degree tends to be uh, somewhat bounded. Now, here we see another picture which corresponds to the, uh, uh, the Internet. Physicists often have a different way of somehow binning these uh, things, uh, and that's why this picture looks much, uh, much uh, uh, smoother. So somehow different values are taken together here in a binning procedure. Now, in the empirical evidence, often by physicists, is that this power law exponent, which plays an important role, is often found or estimated to lie in between two and three. Now, why is that relevant? Well, if tau is larger than two, this probability distribution has a finite mean. But if tau is strictly smaller than three, then this probability distribution has, a, has an infinite variance. So this is typically related to heavy-tailed phenomena in, prob in probability theory. Random variables that have finite mean, but infinite variance. You see huge fluctuations, typically, of those. And these are the reason why you see these huge fluctuations here. Okay? Now, there's also tolls that are reported that are larger than three. So, I mean, it's certainly not that we will be restricting to this case, but it will be a case that, that will be uh, on our agenda. Now, a second phenomenon that many of the real world networks share is what is sometimes called the small world phenomenon. And small world phenomenon is nothing but uh, indicating that typical distances within this, uh, uh, these networks are relatively small, despite the fact that these networks themselves are extremely large. So suppose you're on a, a two-dimensional torus, which is very large, and it will have width square root of n by square root of n, so typical distances will be of the order square root of n. Now, as n tends to infinity, n is a million, square root of n actually becomes sizable. Now, here you see something quite different, so these are the distances within the strongly connected component of the World Wide Web. And here are the distances within the Internet Movie Database. These are all networks that are quite large. This is over a million. And yet you see that these distances are at most, well, seven or eight, I mean, here maybe ten. So distances really are very small, and you should not think of those as being a, an inverse power of the size of the network. That's typically what we see. Okay, so can we understand that? Can we model that? Now, Facebook, of course, is an example that, 
uh, that maybe is one of the largest networks that we can actually uh, plot. I mean, we have all the data, or at least Facebook has all the data. And at a certain moment in time, somewhere in, in 2011, they shared the data with a few uh, computer scientists, and they started analyzing it. And this is a non-trivial issue for all sorts of computational reasons, because at the time, uh, the, the Facebook website, or the Facebook network, consisted of 721 million users. So if you want to do, let's say, a computation of the diameter, that's actually pretty difficult, because you would have to, pair, have to look at the graph distance between any pair of those. So 721 times 721 million, that's actually quite a lot. So this is a, a computationally a very difficult problem, and it was resolved uh, by you know, a whole collection of, uh, um, of computer scientists. And one of the things that they've been seeing is that you know, within Facebook, you have four degrees of separation. This is somewhat related to the six degrees of separation that are claimed to hold for, uh, for social networks. And um, that looks like this. So if you look at the distances within the, within the entire Facebook graph, you get something like this. And here you see that it's actually much smaller than the previous ones even. So the, the largest value here seems to be six. Actually, it's not because the diameter is 59. But these are proportions that are very small. Right? So you know, if, if I think of this as a probabilist, there's a very thin tail here somewhere that I don't really care about. The average value is roughly five. And five corresponds to four degrees of separation. Yes? Ah, no, 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 no. They actually computed the diameter. And that's a non-trivial computation. And you cannot really do that by looking at the graph distance between any pair of vertices. Uh, that's just way too much. You have to do that in a much more clever way. And actually, the, the, the problem was an algorithmic problem using a clever algorithm. I think it's called hyperbole or something like that. Yeah. But for me, that's not relevant. I'm not so interested in, in diameters when I'm talking about uh, uh, distances, because diameters tend to be extremely sensitive to small perturbations of your graph. If I start with a graph and add a very long line to it, the diameter will change dramatically. But if the line is relatively small compared to the size of the network, actually my typical distances don't really change. So I'm looking for something that is a bit more robust. And these typical distances tend to be much more robust to small variations in the graph. Therefore, I, I think of them as being a better way of representing the small world phenomenon. All right, so this is six degrees of separation, which comes from a play. And actually, in the play, the, uh, the main actor says the following uh, uh, quote. Everybody on this planet is separated only by six other people. Six degrees of separation. Between us and everybody else on this planet. The president of the United States, a gondolier in Venice. It's not just the big names. It's anyone. A native in the rainforest, an Eskimo. I am bound to everyone on this planet by a trail of six pe people. It's a profound thought. It almost becomes a bit philosophical. Now, how should you interpret these small distances? Well, I come from a relatively small country, which is called the Netherlands. And uh, even though it's quite small, we have 17 million inhabitants. So you know, if you think about distances in such a network, they might actually be relatively large. But now I'll argue why this is not the case. So each of us in the Netherlands knows some sort of relatively important person, the director of your high school, the boss of, your, of the firm that you're working with, or whatever. Now, this person moves in different of social circles than you do. And they probably have somebody who's even more influential. You know, if you go up that way and becoming more and more influential, you'll probably end up with the most influential person in the Netherlands, which arguably is the king. Okay? Or maybe the previous queen that we have. Okay? Now, I'll argue that in the Netherlands, in three hops, you can actually get to the queen. Previous queen. <coughs> but if everybody can do that, then actually, in six hops, you're with everybody else. And that really is believed to be the way how these six degrees of separation go. And we'll see that come back in, in much of the theory of the random graphs behind it. People with very high degree, the socially, socially active people, the socially wealthy people, are probably connected to even more socially active individuals. Okay? So in my case, for example, the previous rector of our university invited the queen over for the, the 50 year anniversary of uh, the, uh, the, the, the university. And at that moment, he shook the hand of the queen. Now, I've shaken the hands of the rector. So in two hops, I'm actually with the queen. If you count a hop as having shaken hands. 
So you know, these things go very quickly. But that really is the picture that you should have in mind. So probably halfway the, the, the path between the Eskimo and the, uh, you know, the native in the rainforest, you will see somebody very influential. Could be Obama, could be the president of Brazil. Somebody. All right. Now, models for complex networks, I already uh, uh, mentioned some of these. So I'll be talking about some of the classical models in random graph theory. There, will, there are way more models, and actually models are being invented every day. And in a certain sense, what we need to do is bring some order in that jungle. And I think we can in, in, in one way or another. So I'll, I'll discuss these models in some detail, but then I'll also have a slide with sort of different models, and I'll try to explain why these models have come up. Okay, so the first model is what is called the inhomogeneous random graph. Edges are there independently, but not necessarily equally. If they would be there equally, it's the erdos renyi random graph that we all know very well. Um, the second model is what is called the configuration model. In the configuration model, you have more freedom to fix a degree sequence. And that may actually be quite useful because in some of the models, we actually see uh, degree distributions that are of different than what you would get in these inhomogeneous random graphs. For example, in inhomogeneous random graphs, you will always have isolated vertices in the sparse setting. Now, in many cases, for example, in the internet, well, the internet better be connected, otherwise we cannot communicate by email. So you cannot have isolated vertices. And somehow, the configuration model allows you to go a little bit more in that direction. Preferential attachment was a very powerful model and a very inspirational model in a certain sense because it gave a way of explaining where the power loss, the scale-free phenomenon comes from. So I'll discuss that a little bit. And then of course the whole question is, you know, if you have different models aiming to model the same real world phenomena, well do these models behave in a similar way? That's a a question sometimes called universality amongst physicists. You have different models, do they behave in a similar way? Now, if they wouldn't, we would be in a bit of trouble because, you know, if a practitioner would come to us and say, you know, I have this kind of a network, a uh, real-world network, I'm trying to model it, can you propose me a model? You know, if, if I would take two of these models that have very similar characteristics and my answers would be completely different, then which one am I supposed to trust? Okay? So that's actually an important feature. And in many respects, we will see that uh, you know, many of these models actually do behave in a universal way. Properties are somewhat similar across different models, even though there are lots of uh, properties that are actually vastly different. All right, so erdos renyi we've certainly seen this. We start with a complete graph and we perform percolation on it. Uh, that's one way of putting it. So on the complete graph, each of the edges are being kept with probability p independently of each other. Now, you should bear in mind that I'm actually interested in what is called the sparse setting, uh, a bit different from what we've seen uh, in many of the talks so far. The reason is that my real-world networks tend to be sparse. So they have a bounded average degree. So if I want to model that, then I better take p of the form some lambda divided by n so that the average degree is going to be this parameter lambda. Of course, this model has uh, attracted a lot of attention, amongst others in the combinatorial probability community, because it can be used for all sorts of counting problems, and uh, I will not touch upon that. I will really look at my random graphs as ways of modeling the real world. So that's actually the new influx that started in 1999. That uh, sort of came on top of the whole combinatorial a program where people were looking at random graphs as ways, well, sometimes in the probabilistic method, to uh, prove properties of deterministic sequences using sort of probabilistic tools. And we'll see some examples of that as well. Now, one of the problems with the erdos renyi random graph in this context is that it's perfectly egalitarian. So every vertex plays the same role in distribution. The degree distribution, or the degree, of a particular vertex will be a binomial random variable with parameters n and lambda over n. So, erdos renyi random graph. If I look at the degree of any vertex, it will actually have a distribution that is binomial with parameter n minus 1. That's the potential neighbors that I could have. And probability p. And in the sparse setting, that will be roughly this, 
Now, anybody who's done a course in probability theory has probably seen that these binomials where this parameter tends to infinity and the p tends to zero at an inverse proportional rate, that these random variables are very close to Poisson random variables with parameter lambda. Now, we know that Poisson random variables have extremely thin tails. The tails of a, a Poisson distribution are even thinner than exponential. So that because you have these very thin tails, you will actually see a maximum degree that is of the order log n over log log n. Now, that does not compare well with the scale-free phenomenon that we've seen in the, uh, the real-world networks. There, the largest degree tends to be way larger. So the problem is the, the fact that this whole problem is, is egalitarian. There's not enough variation that is in the model. So one way of introducing the variation in the model is to basically look at a, at a model that is very similar, but rather than saying that all the edge probabilities are the same, the edge statuses are still going to be independent random variables, but with different edge probabilities. Now, of course, what different means is in the, is in the eye of the beholder, so it really depends on how you want to set this up. And I'll give one example, which is sometimes called the generalized random graph, in which is that this is done in a, in a particularly pretty way. Um, but there's very general papers, including one by Bela Bolabash, uh, Svante Janssen, and Oliver Reardon uh, in 2007, that actually studies this in, in complete generality and establishes sort of laws of large numbers for the giant component, distances, and, and, and lots of other things. So that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting paper. All right, so what is this generalized random graph? Well, I'll be choosing my edge probabilities in a very special way. And I'll explain a little bit why we choose it this way. So I have a network of size n, and then I have some sequence of weights that are associated to the vertices. So vertex i receives the weight wi. And then the edges are all independent random variables, but the edge probabilities are moderated by the weights. And they're moderated in such a way that the edge between i and j is there with probability wi, wj, divided by a certain normalization. In this case, it's convenient to choose this. And here, ln is the sum of the weights. And I'll always use this symbol here to denote the vertex set 1 up to n. Okay? There's other variations of this model. Chung and Lu have a sequence of papers studying uh, uh, the variation where you take pij to be wi, wj over ln. Now, this could be larger than 1, which is a problem if it's a probability. Therefore, you cap it off at 1. Now, there's another paper by Norris and Reitu, where they choose pij to be 1 minus e to the power minus wi wj over ln. Now, typically, this ratio of wi wj over ln will be pretty small, because ln will grow linearly, whereas these weights are not going to be terribly large. So then it actually means that up to leading order behavior, actually all of these models, for all of these models, the pij will be roughly this and there's a higher order uh, correction. And in fact, there's an interesting paper by Svante Janssen from 2010 where he gives general conditions for asymptotic equivalence of these different models. So basically saying, you know, the model with this PIJ actually can be coupled in such a way, we've heard about coupling this morning, can be coupled in such a way that it actually agrees with the model with these probabilities with a probability that it tends to 1. That's a pretty strong statement. All right. Now, sometimes this model call is called the random graph with prescribed expected degrees. And the reason for that is that uh, you can think of this wi here as being very close to the expectation of the degree of vertex i. Now, why is that? Well, if I look at the expected degree of vertex i, Well, that's nothing but the sum over j unequal to i of pij. 
Because this will be the expected number of edges that, you, that are going to be there. This is the probability that edge ij is there. Now if I just assume that pij is roughly wi wj over ln, that ln, like for all of these three models, then what you're going to get is that this is roughly the sum over j unequal to i, wi, wj divided by ln. Now if these numbers are all relatively small, I might as well forget about this, because this one contribution is going to vanish compared to the sum of all of them. And then actually what I get is a sum of the w's, which is going to cancel the ln, and this will be wi. So basically what you should bear in mind is that the degree of vertex i will be very close to a Poissonian random variable with parameter wi. So di is going to be approximately a Poisson random variable with parameter wi. Now by varying these wi's rather substantially, you can get that these degrees actually vary quite a bit. So if some of the vertices have wi's that are extremely large, now, Poisson random variable is very well concentrated, then also their corresponding degrees are going to be very large. And then we're in business. So the WI really creates inhomogeneity that was lacking in the uh, erdos ranger random graph. Is that clear? Any questions about this model? Now, of course, one of the things that I haven't said is how to choose these WIs. And you can do that in very many ways. Um, what I will be assuming is that somehow on average these weights are nicely behaved. They're sufficiently regular. And that's captured in the following uh, condition. It may look a bit scary, but it's actually not that bad. So suppose you look at the empirical distribution of the weights. So this is just the, this is a distribution function, and it's the proportion of weights that are less than or equal to some x. Now this clearly is a distribution function for any uh, weight, uh, di weight uh, sequence. And therefore I can investigate what happens when n becomes very big. That's in general the, li the, the setting that I'll be interested in. I'll take a limit of n tending to infinity. My networks become larger and larger. Now, of course when the network becomes larger and larger, we would like to see some sort of stability. For example, if you think about the erdos renyi random graph, you would have to take wi to be this, and if n tends to infinity, this indeed converges to lambda. So this is very nicely and regular. Now, in general, what I would like is that this distribution function converges to some limiting distribution function, and that's the same thing as saying that a random variable with that distribution function converges in distribution to some limiting random variable. So this is basically saying that the weights, on average, don't grow too quickly. Now, in, in, in probability theory, we know that when you have a sequence that satisfies some now in nice uh, uh, tightness, then actually along subsequences you will find a converging subsequence. So actually, you can think of this as occurring, for example, when the average, the average weight remains bounded. Maybe you'll have to go along a subsequence, but who cares? So in some other instances, we need a little bit more regularity. So if I have this random variable converging in distribution to some limiting random variable, then sometimes it will be true that also some of the moments will converge along. In fact, we'll only be interested in two moments. So the first moment converging to the first moment of this limiting random variable, and that will actually imply that the average weight of a vertex will remain bounded, and it will actually converge to this number. So this basically enforces sparseness of my network. Okay? And the fact that this is strictly positive is to ensure that somehow the, the limiting graph is not completely empty which is not a very interesting setting. And sometimes we'll also need that the second moment converge. Not always, but that's why I've put it here as, a, as an assumption. So these are just somehow saying that your weights are sufficiently nice. So how could we achieve that? Well, as a probabilist, one of the things that you could do is you could take your weights to be IID random variables, completely independently of the random graph involved. And then if I look at this, this will be Clevenko Cantelli, the empirical distribution of a sequence of IID random variables converges to the limiting random variable. This is the law of large numbers. The average of your IID random variables will converge to the mean, 
And this would be the law of large numbers for the second moment of your random variables. So this is all very well covered in, in probability theory. And that's, uh, that's certainly a setting that you could have in the back of your mind. Now the nice thing about taking these Ws to be IID is that the graph is somehow exchangeable again. Every vertex in distribution plays the same role. The difficulty is that you have double randomness. And if you average out over the weights and over the edges, the edges are no longer going to be independent random variables. In fact, they're going to be positively correlated. So this is a setting that, you know, okay, it's, it's very interesting, but I tend to try to avoid it. Uh, so instead, I just think of my WIs as being deterministic, satisfying my three hypotheses. And one way of doing that is by taking your WIs to be some function of I over N. And in fact, what you have to do is you have to take one minus the limiting degree, the limiting weight distribution, and then take the generalized inverse of that of I over N. And then actually it's known that if you uh, consider this distribution function, you can compute explicitly what it is, and it's very easy to see that this will converge to this target distribution that we're shooting at. That's a simple computation that is done in, in chapter six of my, books, my book. Now, of course, we were interested in scale-free phenomena for which somehow the degree distribution will have to obey a parallel. And as you can see, the only way how I can get this sequence of random variables to obey a power law is when their inputs satisfy a power law. Because if this weight becomes very big, the Poisson random variable is going to be very well concentrated. So the fluctuations are not going to be coming from the Poissonian, so they better be in the weights. So basically, it says that if you want to have a power law, you better stick in a power law to start out with. So your F distribution needs to uh, correspond to a power law, and this is the sort of the canonical example of what such a power law distribution would look like. So this is a power law on the interval between A and infinity. Okay? And in this case, you can comp compute explicitly what this WI corresponds to, and it is this. Okay? So you see something that depends on N divided by J to a certain power that is related to the power law that is in our weights. Very explicit. And in fact, this is the model that uh, Fan Chang and uh, uh, Lincoln Liu studied in, uh, in the first setting, in their very first papers. All right. Now, of course, now that we've developed this methodology to think about these inhomogeneous random graphs, we have the weight distributions, we have their asymptotic uh, properties, we may think about what happens to the random graph itself. Okay, so suppose I would look at the degree of a random vertex. Let's say that Vn is a uniform vertex in between 1 and n. Now if I just stick this in, then I'm going to be getting that this should be very close to a Poisson random variable with the weight of a random individual. If you think a little bit about this, this W of Vn actually has the same distribution as my Wn, which has distribution function Fn. Okay. Because what is my Fn here? Well, it actually is described by the weight of a random individual, because I'm dividing here through by 1 over n, and I'm summing out over all of the weights, over all of the vertices. So that means that the random variable that has this distribution function is nothing but the weight of a uniform individual. And that's precisely what this is. Okay? So if we assume that this condition holds, so condition 1, 6, 3, A, well, that will imply that Wn converges in distribution to W. But then if I look at this random variable, I just have a Poisson with a parameter that converges in distribution. Well, such a random variable also converges in distribution, and this will converge to a Poisson random variable with a random parameter. So this is sometimes called a mixed Poisson distribution. Mixed because we're taking its parameter here to be random. Okay? So this is suggestive 
in saying that if I were to draw a vertex uniformly at random from my graph and inspect its degree, that the distribution of that degree is very close to a Poisson random variable with its mixing distribution. But actually, a property is true that is a bit stronger. Namely, if I look at the proportion of vertices that have degree k, that proportion, which is a random variable, because all my degrees are random variables, that probability will converge in probability under my model to a limiting random variable, limiting probability, which is precisely the probability that this Poisson random variable with the random parameter is equal to k. So Poisson distribution, e to the power minus lambda, lambda to the power k divided by k factorial, but now you should replace lambda by w because w is random. And that's precisely what this does. Okay? And it's not very hard to see that if you want to have a, let's say, a power law for this limiting thing, you better start out with a power law for your weight distribution itself. So this basically tells us that power laws of the degree distribution come hand in hand with power laws of the weight distribution. This clear? Is this stuff about Poisson random variables clear? Okay, very good. So this was the very first model. And this very first model really is an adaptation of the erdos rinne random graph. So the erdos rinne random graph is somehow too homogeneous. Our network data is not at all homogeneous, so let's make it inhomogeneous and see whether it might fit better. Well, what we've seen is that there are settings that you can imagine where actually the degree distribution does obey a power law, whereas in the uh, erdos rinne random graph itself, it doesn't. That's basically the message. Now, there's another class of models which goes under the name of uh, the configuration model, which is a little bit more restrictive. So in the configuration model, you fix the degrees of every vertex. So from a practitioner's point of view, this may actually be very relevant. Well, suppose I have my real-world network. It has, I know everything about it. I know all the degrees, I know the whole structure, etc., etc. Suppose I count 2,000 triangles. Is that more than what you would expect? Or is it less? Well, how do you go about approaching such a question? Well, one way of doing it is the following. You say you have your network that is given, and you compare it to a uniform network with the same properties. In this case, the same the degree distribution. Just chosen uniformly at random. Don't ask me how to do that. That's actually not so easy. But we'll get back to that. But think of it as being a uniform choice out of the collection of all random graphs with that degree distribution. There's at least one, and there's probably many of them. Count the number of triangles in all of them. That's actually a, a probability distribution. You know, if your 2,000 that you were seeing is much larger than what you would get out of this random choice of, uh, of a model, then somehow there are more triangles than you would believe just on the basis of the degree distribution. So your model tends is more highly clustered than you, what you would believe on the basis of a random, uh, the random graph. That's a useful comparison, because otherwise you don't really know what to compare the 2002, right? And that's, in a certain sense, what people have been trying with this model, with the configuration model. Now, that's not the origin of the model. The origin of the model lies really within probabilistic combinatorics, because it was used to count how many graphs there are with a given degree distribution. That really is the, the origin, which is in the 80s. Uh, Bela Bolabash wrote a very important paper about this. Uh, this was inspired by a paper by Bender and Canfield, and later on there were papers by Molloy and Reed, and uh, uh, basically investigating the giant component, but the model really took off a bit later uh, by a paper by Newman, Strogatz, and Watts, and this was one of these highly influential papers in the 1999, 2000, 2001 era, where they used this model to do explicit computations. Non-rigorous, but they were, you know, they were quite right with their uh, uh, analysis. Um, 
And the funny thing of, is that Newman, Strokowitz, and Watts did refer to Molloy and Reed, but not to the earlier papers, which explains why I think this one has about 2,000 citations, this one 1,500 or so, and it, it goes down as you go further up. Uh, so Newman, Strokowitz, and Watts did refer to this paper, but not to the other two. Uh, citations are typically unfair. So some people now call this the Molloy and Reed model. I don't think this is the proper name, uh, but somehow these names stuck. So what is the setting? Again, it's a very static setting. So rather than having weights, we now try to describe um, the structure of the vertices by their degree distribution, by their degrees. So I'm assuming that I somehow have a collection of degrees. They're given to me. For example, because they came, come from a real world network. I'm looking at a simple graph, so no multi-edges, no self-loops, etc. And I'm just looking at a collection of vertices which I will denote by n, and I will later take n to infinity, and a corresponding collection of degrees. So vertex 1 has degree d1, vertex 2 has degree d2, vertex 3 has degree d3, etc., etc. And I will assume that these are known. Okay? Now a very important special case of this is when you take all these degrees to be equal. And this is sometimes called the random regular graph. Well, this would be the random regular graph potentially with self-loops and multiple edges. Okay. Now, sometimes we will take these degrees to be IID, and we will be particularly focusing on settings where uh, these degrees obey power laws, either because that's modeled in into their deterministic structure, or because we take these degrees as an IID sequence having a power law distribution. Both are possible. Okay, I haven't yet told you how to construct the model, how to construct the graph. So, so far I've only given you the input. Um, and in order to describe how this is being done, let me show you an animation. Okay, let me make this a bit bigger. So this animation comes from a, a website that we've been working on, which is called the Network Pages. And this is uh, all sorts of sort of broad audience articles about network features um, aimed at, let's say, high school students, bachelor students, and so on. So here, for example, there is a there is an article about degrees in real world networks. So a bit of the introduction that I was giving before, but now sort of written with very little mathematics. Now, in this website, we also have a site that has demos. And this is one of them. Okay, so let's take a somewhat more sizable graph. And let's, oh, the negative number is invalid. That's perfectly true. Okay, so it may be a little difficult to see, but what, mm, let's make that graph a bit smaller then you can e more easily see this. Okay, so what you see here is that the vertices have these little spokes coming out of them. You should think of those as being half edges. And we're pairing half edges, and if you pair two half edges, two times a half is one, you get one edge. And we do this in the simplest way possible, namely completely uniformly at random. So, you take a half edge, you pair it to a broader half edge, which is a uniform other half edge, unequal to the one that you have. You pair them up, it creates an edge, and that's your first edge. Then you go to a second half edge. Pair it up again, forms a, an edge. You draw the edge, and you continue all the way until it's done. Well, your sum of degrees better be even, otherwise this is never going to terminate. And in fact, we know that degree sequences of all graphs, multigraphs, simple graphs, whatever, the degrees have to sum up to something even. That's the handshake lemma. So we'll, we will always be assuming that. Um, now, of course, you may be worried here because I'm particularly interested in simple graphs. So there's no self-loops and no multiple edges. Well, we see in this setting that actually you can have self-loops. 
And there's no reason whatsoever why you wouldn't. Because, you know, if I'm a vertex and I have 25 half edges, I might just connect two of them together and then I'm going to have a self-loop. I'm not ruling this out, for very good reasons, by the way. Okay? So there, will, there may be self-loops and there may also be multiple edges. If I have degree 25 and somebody else has degree 100, I might actually connect two of my 25 half edges to the other guy. That's all part of the game. Now you may also be wondering, or worrying, about the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm connecting half edges. In which order are you doing it? Yeah, 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 multiple edges. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. there's also multiple edges. Well, not always, but there can be. I don't know. I once during a talk had a, a setting where, uh, oh, where I didn't have any. But you know, this is all a matter of chance. Now I'm a probabilist, so I should know something about that. And of course, all the time it goes wrong. That's uh, Murphy's law, I guess. Um, so you may be worrying about the order in which you do things. But it turns out that the order doesn't matter. Again, you see multiple edges and one self-loop. The order doesn't matter. And that's because in probabilistic terms, this whole connection process is what we would call exchangeable. So if, you know, if I swap some stuff around, uh, rather than going from left to right along the circle, or I go from right to left, or you know, doesn't matter how, I will still, in distribution, get the same law. Of course, my realization may be completely different, but in distribution, I will get precisely the same thing. You're even allowed to let your pairing of half edges depend on your past. And that's particularly convenient. Because, for example, if I would want to know what the neighborhood of a vertex is, well, I'm going to be pairing his half edges, then I know what his neighbors are. But then I might actually want to pair those half edges that are incident to these neighbors first. Because, you know, I'm trying to explore, let's say, breadth first. Right? Now, if it would not be allowed to do this, then life would become much more difficult. You are allowed to do this, which is particularly nice. So in many cases, you can sort of build up your neighborhoods of vertices gradually as you go along. It's a very nice property. But you have to live with the consequences, and the consequences are you may have self-loops and you may have multiple edges. All right, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so that was the model. And this is what you get for a degree sequence if you choose your degrees to be IID from a parallel distribution and then plot it in log-log scale in precisely the same way as it was doing for uh, real-world networks. Well, apart from the fact that I'm not looking at proportions here but at numbers, that doesn't change very much. It just shifts the, uh, uh, the plot upwards. And what you see very similarly to these real-world networks is that you have something which looks like a straight line and it's relatively smooth in the beginning, and then you see this thing that sort of widens up towards the end because you have stochastic fluctuations in the very high values. Identical to what you see in real-world networks. So in that sense, you know, it really is alike. Now here's the graph construction in words. Let me go over it. I showed it to you in, uh, in a demo, but maybe it's nicer to do it actually uh, in words as well. So, you assign dj half edges to a vertex j. You assume that the total degree is even. Handshake lemma. You pair half edges to create edges one by one by arbitrarily numbering them from one to ln in any order. Then you first connect the first half edge at random with one of the other ones, ln minus one. Then you remove those two half edges and then you go to the next available half edge. It could be that you've connected to the second half edge and it's already gone. But if the second half edge is still there, you're going to take the second half edge. And then you just continue. Okay? And the notation for this graph is the CM and N of D. And I'm using this uh, uh, generalized random graph. It's very similar notation. So that, you know, when I write down a model, you at least know about which random graph I'm talking. All right. Now, very similarly to the setting with the weights, it's not obvious how you should pick your degrees. And again, 
we want to pick them in a suitably nice way. That somehow the, the average degree converges and maybe even the different proportion of uh, uh, vertices with given degrees. So the proportion of vertices with degree one, the proportion of vertices with degree two, proportion of vertices with degree three, etc., etc. We would like them all to converge, to have some sort of a regularity. And that's what we're assuming here. We again look at the empirical degree distribution. And now what we assume is that um, this dn, which has this distribution function fn, converges in distribution to this d. Now in this case, it's obvious that this dn distribution is a distribution on the integers. And therefore, this condition i dot 7 dot 5 is equivalent to saying that the probability that dn is equal to k converges to the probability that d is k. Weak convergence of integer random var variables converging to integer random variables is equivalent to saying that their probability mass function converges. That's what this says. Now, if I want to translate this in terms of graph properties, this is the same thing as saying that n of k divided by n, where n of k is the number of vertices for which the degree is equal to k, if I divide that through by n, that this will converge to some limiting degree distribution, who's di who's, uh, who we write as a random variable capital D. Okay? In the second assumption, we're going to be assuming that the average degree converges. And in the third assumption, we're going to assume that the second moment of the degrees converges. Very similar to the, the regularity conditions for the weights. OK. Um, now that I've given the introduction of the configuration model, I've basically been talking for an hour. I think it's a good idea to have a small break of a quarter of an hour. And then I will resume uh, telling you some properties of this configuration model and the reason why it can actually be used to compute things. <coughs> Unless there are questions, of course. <laughs>